Welcome everyone to a very abridged crash course fountain pen introduction. So there's a lot of information that I'm not covering in this video just to save time and I will also post links down below to some really helpful videos that can help you in understanding this vast world of fountain pens. So first we'll get started with the anatomy of a fountain pen. We have what is called the grip section. This is where you grip the pen, basically. It's pretty straightforward. At the end, we have the finial, which is also sometimes called a blind cap or a piston knob, depending on the type of filler your fountain pen is, and we'll get into that later. We have the body of the pen and, of course, the nib. Taking a closer look at the nib, we have what is called the breather hole. And then, there's a line that divides the nib running down to the breather hole and creates two tines. On some nibs, there's actually three tines, and there's even a nib, like the Pilot Parallel Pen, that only has one tine, if you could call it a tine. I don't know if it's a tine at that point. Um, the shoulders of the, the nib, which influence how flexible a nib can be. And then here, arguably one of the most important features of a fountain pen is the feed and this is what regulates the ink flow and the air exchange. And then of course there's the cap with a finial at the end and a clip and a cap band which is decorative but also helps prevent the cap from cracking and some stress fractures can occur. To post means to put the cap on the back of your pen this is a personal preference. It will change the balance of the fountain pen. Often it will make it longer. Some people are worried about the cap scratching their, their pen bodies. Um, so everybody has kind of a different preference. But you'll hear that term a lot. Uh, a tip that is just helpful, um, and that is to close your pen up when you're not writing with it. Um, I am particularly paranoid about my nib drying out when I'm thinking or pausing, but it's not that big of a deal. You can get your pen to start up again. <laughs> I just don't like it to dry out. But you can't leave it open like you could with a ballpoint or a gel pen. And then blotting paper is used to absorb the excess ink. Fountain pens put a lot more ink down on the paper than other pens. And depending on the ink and the pen and the paper, uh, different drying times occur. And so it's just nice to have some blotting paper around so that you don't have to wait for your ink to dry. There are many different types of filling mechanisms. I think these are fun. I'm going to lump a couple of these together because they all have an internal rubber sack and that is what actually is holding the ink. These particular systems you you see in, in vintage fountain pens uh, and <laughs> vintage is a loose term that everyone seems to have a different idea of what that means and when a vintage pen becomes a vintage pen. So here we have a blind cap with a button filler. We have a lever filler, and this actually depresses a pressure bar on the inside, which then in turn depresses the rubber sack. And then we have a crescent filler, which is Mark Twain's favorite, and also the first successful self-filling mechanism for a fountain pen. And here's what a sack looks like. The simplest filling mechanism is the eyedropper, and basically you use an eyedropper. It's pretty self-explanatory, and you put the ink directly into the body, and voila, you're done. Very simple. Sometimes you need to burp these pens because an air bubble gets trapped inside and has no way of being released. Then we have cartridges and cartridge converters. And basically a cartridge is a throwaway plastic container of ink. 
and they're used to be disposable, although you can refill it with a syringe. And then a cartridge converter just makes these pens um, capable of having a mechanism to refill, and so you could use bottled ink instead. And there's a huge variety of cartridges as, or converters as, as well that aren't just piston, some of them are, um, you squeeze them and there's other kinds. This one's my favorite. This is the snorkel, the most complicated filling system in a fountain pen, but it's super cool. <laughs> Came out in the 1950s. Vacuum filler and piston filler are very similar in the internal workings, but they work just a little bit different. I don't know if I'll be able to explain it very well. With a piston, you turn the knob, it pushes down like a... I'm not going to explain it. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I was just like, no, I, this is too hard to explain. I wish I had a demonstrator fountain pen, a clear fountain pen, to show you the inner workings. Um, this custom, pilot custom that I'm using actually is a vacuum filler, but, and it is a demonstrator, but it's full of ink, so I can't, I can't show you right now. There's a whole lot of different types of nibs, and I forgot, tipping material. This is really important, actually. Uh, that's what you're writing on. It's not the nib material itself, whether it's gold or steel or some other exotic material you're actually writing upon the tipping material, unless it has worn off or been ground off by a nib smith. And there's just a massive variety of different types of nibs. There's thick nibs and thin nibs and juicy nibs and dry nibs and stiff nibs like this manifold and flexible nib like this wall number two, where you can see those tines separating out. There's springy nibs and <laughs> it just, too much information for this video, I think. Uh, but like I said, I'll try to find some good resources and refer to them down below in the description. There's of course different papers, there's different inks. It's just, this is a big world and it's fun to discover and explore. Thank you all for watching. If you have any questions, of course, let me know. Happy writing.